Today we're joined by Max Isle. Um, Max, um, you're a friend, longtime friend. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself? Where are you calling from? Absolutely. My name is Max Isle. I am a postdoc at the Merriam Center in the University of Tunis, where I am hailing from. Uh, I'm in Tunis, where I've been for most of the last decade. And I am a historian and I work on climate issues and I'm a longtime activist and supporter of uh, Palestine and uh, all movements against uh, imperialism and colonialism. If I'm not mistaken, Max, I think you spent like quite a significant amount of time in, in Palestine, um, I think specifically in Gaza. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I lived in Gaza for five months, actually, right before starting my PhD program, which uh, gives a lot of perspective, for sure. Um, and uh, it's, of course, been very uh, anchoring, I think, as I as I do my work. Uh, so today, um, we're going to be talking about this two part uh, series or this two part article series that you wrote for Agrarian South Journal of Political Economy called uh, Palestine's uh, Great Flood. Um, and, you know, this This is kind of a interesting, uh, first of all, I don't know if articles come in two parts, um, but it seems that this has been a quick turnaround in publishing um, because this is, you're kind of intervening uh, as it happens, you know, um, what what is going on, the ongoing genocide and sort of Western collusion uh, in this particular region. But you lay out a kind of broader sort of argument that that is attempting dis, to dispel some of the sort of commonly held notions. I think you kind of, I think, debunk very thoroughly this this broader idea of like international relations theory or IR theory, as it's known in, in poli sci. But maybe um, you could start by kind of like highlighting some of the bigger sort of myths, so to speak, or things that obscure uh, how we view uh, Palestine and the United States and Israel's quote unquote special relationship. Sure. So, uh, you know, the, the whole, uh, the whole discourse is kind of drenched in, uh, mythology at, at every level. And, uh, you know, I think of the mythologies as really trying to hide from view, uh, very essential things, um, which, uh, so I just want to quickly say what they are, and then I'm going to narrow down on your question. I mean, I think the basic relationships is, is you have a settler colonial movement with a fully organic relationship uh, to the mutual benefit of the upper classes in both countries with uh, U.S. imperialism. And against it, you have uh, a national liberation movement within the Palestinian homeland that itself for liberation relies on an organic relationship with uh, broader struggles in the region for uh, sovereignty and uh, possibly uh, liberation, which of course is more expansive, right? So this is, uh, you know, this is how I think is appropriate for people who believe in liberation to, um, or at least it's, it's one very good approach, I should say, for people who believe in liberation to uh, approach the what's called the the Palestine Israel conflict, right? Um, and um, of course, there's other traditions as well, which are not mine, but of course are uh, in fact embraced in in their ways by people who are actually carrying the burden of liberation, which is why I I edited myself actually just to be clear. Um, it, with that said, you know one of the one of the fundamental uh, mythologies that is very dominant at this moment. In, uh, and, and is gaining more traction, particularly within the kind of moderate left in the United States and the UK, like the social democratic left, who just wants to do some, some tinkering, a little re-engineering, a little softening, a little uh, shaving off the rough edges of the, of the current regime. Um, because I think it is a regime co uh, governing uh, that, that governs the US landmass and too many other land masses as well, is this idea that there is something called the Israel lobby that's diverting the U.S. from its national interest. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, like I think a lot of people who are otherwise sympathetic to broader struggles for liberation um, may fall into accepting this uh, way of framing the issue, not least because it's very clear that there are Zionists, self-professed, 
in the United States who are acting in ways that are obviously nefarious to the well-being of not only people in Palestine or in Syria, Yemen, uh, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, right? Not only there, Tunisia, I should say, where there, we can talk about that, um, but also people in uh, racialized communities in the United States, right? It's very well known, for example, or I think it's very well known, but um, for example, that the so-called Anti-Defamation League, right, spied on anti-apartheid activists, right? Which was like a, a nefarious thing to do. And it's an institution that is associated with Zionism, right? That is, uh, you can say, part of the Israel lobby. It's fine to call it that. That clearly was engaging in something uh, nefarious in the U.S. And so um, that has to be also acknowledged, though, in the analysis. So the way I see it is, and not just it has to be acknowledged, like that's part of the enemy group, clearly, right? Like we don't, I don't want anti-apartheid activists to be spied on by some private or public agency, for that matter, you know. Now, uh, you know, the problem is, of course, I think that th this whole concept of the Israel lobby um, and the national interest are not from my conceptual universe. They're from alien universe, which I have nothing to do with, right, which is uh, international relations theory, where the state is like a black box and it has interests. It has national interests. Um, and then there are lobbies, which maybe represent external forces to the state that are diverting it from uh, 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 its, its kind of normal or rational, but always kind of imputed or assigned because uh, so-called interests, right? Now, um, I have no interest, otherwise I wouldn't be on this podcast, in the U.S. state to begin with, right? That's very clear. But, um, you know, so part of the problem with, with the analysis, right, um, is first of all, that it, underlying it, there is a notion that there's like a U.S. interest that we should have any concern at all about. And of course, like, it's, it's just not the case, right? Um, on the other hand, right, I think people, some people at least, who are using this analysis uh, on, on what I broadly say, like on our side of the aisle, right, are are reacting to something very real, material, concrete, a set of institutions that are acting in a nasty way. So uh, how can we reframe it, right? I see it as, um, of course, like one way of reframing it is that it's lobbies all the way down, right? That uh, imperial, because a, a lobby we can say is a capitalist interest. Um, and US imperialism is just uh, a set of interests, basically uh, capitalist, although sure, like it's always passed through a filter of a kind of ideology, right? Because that's how we understand our world. It, it's a set of interests that mostly agree, disagree about some things. And then whoever takes state power, whatever capitalist they represent, they carry out a policy that uh, is most closely uh, aligned with whoever put them in power, that is who funded them, basically. Um, and that is more or less, you know, to use the very classic phrase, uh, in the overall interests of the ruling class, that is the state, is the executive committee of the ruling class. And the lobby is part of how the state uh, not only carry, uh, 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 forms its interests and, and negotiates all those various pressures, but also, of course, part of making imperialism happen at all, right? Like, it, like people think, uh, you know, it, sometimes there's this idea that like imperialism is just kind of like it's this like device. You just like once it has its little button in motion, uh, you, you press it and then it goes like this juggernaut of evil. Another sort of analogy would be like it, it depends on who's in the driver's seat, right? The car is sort of a neutral kind of thing and then it's like you know it's a neutral technology it only depends on who's at the driver's seat and i think that, i think what you're getting at just to kind of be clear too you're talking about people like john mersheimer i think he's like the biggest uh figure in this who kind of pushes this or who's been sort of more well known for this um this idea of the israel lobby that is sort of taken uh u.s interests and spun them in a way that are that are not you know to its core values or distorting them or something like that Exactly. Right. And like, 
uh, you know, again, it's it's like needless to say in this podcast, but like what on earth is a U.S. core value? Right? U.S. core value is just killing people, right? Even killing killing it, it, its own people, like people who are like part of like the settler class, killing them too, but like especially killing people who are not part of, of the settler class and especially killing colonized people and especially killing people in the third world. Like when has that not been a U.S. interest of the ruling class? Like not only is that, that's like, that's like their main activity, right? So, you know, that's like what to depart from and to say, okay, then you have specific people uh, who are pushing, uh, you know, pushing it here and there, but with an overall consensus about what are, uh, what are, what are the shared goals and what are the red lines, right? So someone like Mearsheimer is, is kind of stating that, you know, he says it explicitly, the U.S. should shift to a strategy of kind of offshore balancing, right, where it should kind of somehow balance these other powers, maintain hegemony over them, not overcommit to kind of the Arab sphere, move to like a two-state solution, um, and then maybe if necessary, kind of uh, commit to some kind of like offshore balancing with China to make sure it doesn't get too aggressive. He also hasn't wanted the U.S. to be in a war with uh, with Russia, with uh, Ukraine, uh, with Russia via Ukraine famously, right? So this is kind of uh, Weirsh uh, Weirsheimer, Mearsheimer uh, has been, I don't know where I came up with that, but it sounds kind of better, I think. Uh, Wersheimer has been like peddling this thing for like over 15 years, right? Um, and we're left kind of wondering, okay, how do we fit refit these pieces together so that they make sense? You know, yeah, and just just to kind of interject a little bit, and that's kind of in the absence of a sort of what you're doing, sort of a system like a world systems analysis of this particular situation and looking at it within the context of of modern imperialism, twenty first century imperialism that has its roots, you know, in a U.S. settler colonial project here, quote unquote, here domestically, um, that is exported uh, domestic, or ex excuse me, ex externally. And I think, you know, in the apps, and it, you know, this is kind of a bigger, sorry to go tangential, but you're, you're making me think a lot about like, sort of the failures of the left in this particular moment, while there's been some really great momentum on the ground, the analysis, you know, there's, you know, in our, the left co uh, uh, commentary or whatever you want to call it, commenting sphere in the US or in the West, Kind of has this sort of diagonalism approach where it's like we'll use the analysis of somebody like john mearsheimer in the absence of our own sort of anti-imperialist analysis for the sake of like alliance or bipartisanship or whatever they're they're saying uh and so you know you're you're very specifically kind of like honing in at the core like that you're like this is an imperialist project and this is why you need to understand this relationship it's not just yeah sure there's ideolo there's ideology that unites these two uh, settler colonies, but fundamentally, you're looking at you know capitalist accumulation and why this specific region is sort of a linchpin in larger sort of um, uh, sort of global uh, geopolitics. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so it, in that sense, we should uh, you know we should have a step back and be like, okay, what are the major uh, U.S. interests? One, it's to prevent the consolidation of kind of fully autonomous poles of technology and accumulation, right? This is why from the U.S. perspective, the U.S. doesn't care uh, exactly all that much. Like the state, the ruling class is not, in my opinion, particularly concerned whether or not China is uh, moving uh, back in the direction of socialism or uh, against it, the U.S. wants a subservient China, right? And the problem is that China is carrying out its own project with its own technological base, with a huge uh, uh, capacity for research and development, is taking the world lead in, in solar, is learning how to do uh, the advanced level, U.S. level microchips, aviation. Iran just uh, also engineered uh, uh, a certain type of rotor that's very important for domestic uh, refurbishment of its airplane stock and so forth. This allows for people to decide their own fate. Um, of course, I am a, a communist, but like th the, the U.S. issue is not just are you a communist or not? It's like, are you independent from us or not? Now, Israel uh, has played a dual role within this kind of um, worldwide ambition, right? On the one hand, overall, Israel has always been very useful at slamming 
projects worldwide that have sought to, to use the phrase from Samir Amin, in any way delink from US capitalism, that is build up some type of autonomy, right? To go on the road somehow to socialism or communism or liberation or independence. Anyone who said, okay, we are gonna decide how to engineer our own politics and use our land the way we see fit um, and use the crops to feed our people. Anyone who's even tried to do that on uh, faces, of course, the enmity of the US. I mean, I tend to think of actually the Cold War as a war against agrarian reform, against radical agrarian reform. It, it's a kind of a way of reframing things. And so uh, that I think is helpful at least to, to step outside of standard frames for a second. Um, Israel has been not only incredibly helpful in the region, right, in the, in the Arab Iranian region, a kind of slamming any project that sought to do that. So they slammed Gamal Abdel Nasser. They slammed the Syrian bath in, when it was very, very radical, right? In, in 1967, there were like Marxist-Leninists in all kinds of positions in Syria. They performed a huge discrediting of these kind of projects that, um, in the whole Arab region. When Nasserism um, was, was popular across the region, like Nasserism was also popular in Lebanon. Nasserism was popular in Jordan. It was enormously discredited. I mean, it, without going it, there were lots of problems with Nasserism to be sure, but it was a project that was trying to de-link from the US capitalist orbit. And actually it was relinking or linking up with the Soviet orbit. It was doing a lot of Eastern Bloc trade and with the defeat of Nasserism, then the downfall in 1970, trade reoriented to the North and the West, that is to Europe and the United States. So it kind of began to reweave. And when the US trades, it profits. The US is not trading uh, for the mutual betterment, like it's like an Adam Smith textbook where like you're trading, I make apples, you make oranges, and you know, we each get some apples and oranges or whatever, comparative advantage. No, the US is trading to, to, to its massive advantage of its capitalist enterprises. So Israel has not only done that in its own sphere, right, in slamming all these projects, destabilizing them, forcing huge portions, like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent of GDP to go to weapons, justifying um the kind of uh, weapons investments on the part of the Gulf, which then uses them uh, for domestic repression or uses them uh, to kind of buy the U.S. interest in their own domestic repression and the U.S. kind of security guarantee or to be used against Yemen to kill hundreds of thousands of people, right? Um, it's justifying a massive kind of gyro of weapons purchases, right, on a world scale. But finally, Israel has been uh, catastrophically engaged in a counterinsurgency operation against liberation projects on a world scale, right? Starting, you know, from the 1950s, um, Israel started to get involved in that. I mean, Israel was part of the tripartite aggression against Gamal Abdel Nasser, right? Especially when in 1956 with, with France and Egypt, this is when Nasser was perceived as a real threat, not only for his own project, but also for supporting the Algerian national liberation struggle, which really pissed off the French because course, they did not want to let go of Algeria. Then Israel uh, helped the French assassinate um, uh, Mehdi Ben Barka, who was one of the most organic intellectuals and organizers in the Arab region and the founder of the Tricontinental Conference, a uh, Moroccan, uh, Moroccan militant, right? Um, you know, Israel then uh, assassinated uh, Hassan Kanafani, whose words were so prescient and shine so bright that we are still being illuminated by them today, right? When we read Hassan, Hassan Kanafani today, we're like, this guy is lighting up our entire understanding of reality, right? And Israel eliminated him um, in 1972. I mean, he was a, this guy by himself, his thoughts, and of course the party he was a part of, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, this was a major threat to the entire world system and Israel murdered him, right? Um, and, it, you know, uh, throughout Africa, throughout uh, in, uh, you know, what was then Rhodesia and is, uh, thank God now Zimbabwe, right, in, uh, in South Africa, uh, the U.S., uh, Israel was absolutely central to supporting the counterinsurgencies and circumventing all sorts of congressional arms embargoes. And let us not talk about uh, its relationship with the Shah, which is the, one of the major oil, uh, you know, Iran is one of the major oil powers of the entire world. So the Shah was keeping, making sure that oil and the profits from it would be organically interlaced with U.S. imperialism. Israel was supporting the Shah. The Shah was in good relationships. Sabak was in good relationships with Israel. And never mind, of course, Latin America, which was kind of ground zero for um, Israeli support for just absolute capitalist brutality, right? Like what they did in Central America in terms of supporting these vicious uh, anti-indigenous um, 
uh, fascist militia um, and in what they they were supporting uh, the Nicaraguan dictator uh, Somoza, they were supporting the Contras, what they did in the Southern Cone um, in Argentina, in Chile, in uh, Brazil, and supporting in particular the very, very, I think it's always good to keep and remember the extremely anti-Semitic uh, Argentinian dictatorship that systematically targeted Jewish communists, right? That was supported by Israel. Like, you know, that was supported by Israel when they were putting concrete blocks on uh, people's feet and dropping them out of helicopters over the sea, that was supported by Israel. So uh, Israel was this kind of, uh, not only carrying out this massive, counter, when you carry out this counterinsurgency, because your whole state is built on racism and your whole state is built on uh, putting yourself at the spear point or, or the hot point, the flash point of the North-South encounter, you are gonna be adored by imperialism and capitalism. And this is uh, generally understood, uh, you know, it, it, by progressive forces, let us say, um, on a world scale, um, although there, there's propaganda against it, which we could talk about a little bit. But um, I think this is also very important for us to understand. Israel has really uh, done a wonderful job from the racist perspective, from the colonial perspective, from the capitalist perspective, in serving imperialism and capitalism and destroying liberationist projects, right? And this you don't find like in, in this whole discussion of national interest is you know an undermining of why Palestine is so important to every kind of uh, ideologically aware radical project on a world scale. Like everyone it knows to support Palestine because of what it symbolizes about how evil the U.S. is, right? Yeah, that's you know that's a really great sort of uh, framing, like looking at the sort of geography and the scope of this because I think people. Um, you know, it's called like Uzi diplomacy, for example. And I remember like growing up as a child, I remember we got a, um, we got like a Nintendo, like af way after the fact that it was, you know, um, after it came out when we were children and there was this game, we had two games, we had Mario three and Contra, which was a, a game that, you know, you had an Uzi and you would go around and, and I had no idea it was connected, you know, at the time to the, the, um, the funding of like the Contras against uh, the Sandinistas, right? And um, I think there's this kind of narrative um, within uh, the sort of Western liberal democracy. And you see this also on the what you identified earlier as the sort of moderate kind of left in the United States. This idea that the that if, you know, if um, the sort of soul of America, so to speak, is at stake in terms of like redirecting it to sort of its foreign policy to sort of more democratic peaceful means then also this quote unquote soul of Israel <laughs> is also at stake because there is an investment in this idea of like a, a quote unquote two state solution um, that the, you know, Israel has sort of diverted from its path at some point in time. And, you know, we just need to get it back on, you know, back on track when in fact, from the very get go, and even before this was a very sort of, uh, you know, genocidal and, and eliminationist uh, settler colonial project. And it's like, you can't, unbake that cake, you know, much in like in the same way you, you know, you can't unbake the cake of the United States. It's lit it's literally ingrained into it's, it operates at a structural level. Um, and we, you know, we can talk about um, how this is sort of challenged. And I, I just want to quote something from your, uh, your first, the first part of the article. Um, and it's, it, you said, you know, the harder and stronger Palestinians fight for liberation. The more, like lightning bolts of every increasing luminosity, they bring the relief of the world system into clearer view. The impotence of the United Nations, the imperialist contempt for international law, the complicity of the Arab neocolonial states within Western capitalism, the fascist racism at the heart of modern European and US capitalism as murderers and maimers operate in Western capitals, the neo-colonial structures of the Arab and third world and the hollowness of Western liberal democracy and its constellation of civil society institutions. And I think this is important because you're, you're setting up, you know, you, you're, you're attempting in this, in these two articles to, you know, what you call uh, in your words, restore self-defense to its proper place at the center of social reproduction and accumulation. So maybe you can describe what you mean by that in the context that in, in the context of the quote that I just gave in the sense that Palestinian resistance has illuminated the sort of contradictions within the sort of imperialist world system. 
For sure. I mean, so the the Palestinian uh, struggle, as far as I see it, is almost impossible structurally to defend in Western civil society, right? It's actually illegal, right, in, uh, in most of Europe. Uh, I, I swear, I think the Netherlands just said even from the river to the sea is a uh, is incitement, right? Um, and first of all, what they're revealing, you know, what this struggle because we're all responding to to a struggle that took place, and this isn't to say that. Um, uh, and I think it's important to say that uh, you know Hamas has always called for an independent investigation of what occurred on October seventh. And so this is what I support as well, an independent investigation. If people want to talk about what occurred on October 7th, then you follow my dude, uh, Mao, and you investigate. If you don't have an investigation, therefore, you do not have a right to speak. So um, because I don't think like uh, Arab uh, guerrilla are, uh, you know, insane, murderous brutes, you know, I think that uh, the, the investigation would would probably reveal would would certainly reveal a narrative completely sharply at odds from from the narrative that uh, the mainstream narrative and even the liberal narrative that of what occurred on October seventh, right? But um, you know what what it's revealed is that there's no account the the not the the this kind of nationalist force itself is revealing there's no space for it in this world. There's no space for what it's fighting for. And, you know, I, I'm not a two-stater, right? I support a liberated Palestine. But what it reveals is that this world itself, because Hamas's line is for um, a long-term hudna, a truce. Like, I think this is their way of navigating various tensions. Um, but in, in a sense, it doesn't matter. Like, Israel will never accept anything except for Palestinian surrender. This is what it's revealing. And it's revealing that the Western states are unwilling to compel Israel to accept any degree of um, decent life for Palestinian people. And this really, and of course, America, of course, isn't. And it's revealing is that there's material investments in the destruction, in the killing of Palestinian children, right? That this is a source of profit for the world system, right? That this is a source of profit for US capital. And it's telling people exactly what they are. It's telling people, this is what Columbia University is right now. If we want a different Columbia University, of course, we give it a new name, but uh, it, it, it can be fought over. You know, I'm an I'm a, I'm a advocate for the most part, not always, but often uh, of fighting for what in some institutions are, right? But in its current form, it cannot be anything, it, it, it cannot uh, have any space for Palestinian liberation, right? That's not permitted at Columbia. It's not permitted in the U.S. Congress. It's not permitted in civil society institutions. It's not permitted in the, the Western press. Um, it's not permitted even to be articulated, right, in, uh, in most of the European states. You can't even say it. So actually, European states are fascist. They don't allow freedom of speech, right? They do not allow freedom of speech for their own people. And that is the, the Palestinian... Uh, armed operation which took place and the Israeli uh, genocidal counterinsurgency in response to it has revealed what these institutions are doing and their role in the reproduction of capitalism and colonialism and imperialism. That these institutions uh, are organically embedded in an imperialist world system. And maybe some of them can change, you know, we should take them over and make them change. I'm like an advocate, not necessarily of US state, but like of like maybe university structures and so forth. That's a different story, which are actually just like, uh, you know, which are actually just banks now that have a have a sideline in education, right? They're actually just like investment funds um, that, that have a little side business where they where they give degrees. But um, you know, nevertheless, you know, I think this revealed everything. This revealed what our world looks like and what it is. And it also, it didn't just, uh, it, it's important to go beyond the, um, uh, it's important to go beyond the, the U.S. sphere. It also revealed what other forces are, right? It revealed, you know, with our guy, Gustavo Petro, like it revealed that there is a capacity in Latin America, despite a lot of counter-revolution against the radical experiments, uh, which are, of course, still fighting for liberation in Latin America, despite like decades of counter-revolution, Gustavo Petro, who's kind of a new kid on the block in terms of taking state power, can still go out there and say, I'm going to break diplomatic relations with Israel, right? 
that is revealing on the good side of it, of what it means to actually have a popular democratic governments in power. Um, and it's revealing about just just interject really quickly, because it's important to point out why he, you know, he when he first took office, one of the first things he did was establish reestablish diplomatic relations with Venezuela. And I think, you know, Venezuela and, and Colombia, like historically, have been very close culturally. You know, there's a lot of Colombians living in Venezuela and a lot of Venezuelans living in Colombia, um, but also the reason why you know people are always singling out israel and it's like you know like israel was funding this dirty war in colombia they were flooding it with weapons and munitions and intelligence and you know doing all kinds of you know uh, security experiments um you know they were using it as a laboratory essentially uh, for counterinsurgency um trying to test the methods they use in palestinians on Colombians, right? And so this isn't just like this isn't just like one day, you know, Gustavo Petro had a, had moral clarity. He's he's probably has friends who were killed. He probably has family members who are affected by this. And I think it's it's so demeaning sometimes to listen to uh, and, and disrespectful to listen to uh, gringos uh, talk about this particular issue and and to think that these are sort of irrational actors, you know, as if they're you know they're just like. They've, he's he's swallowed he's swallowed the pill of anti-Semitism, and he's an irrede irredeemable sort of you know communist uh, leftist uh, anti-Semite you know and it's like it's you can't like what you're describing like even sort of a uh, you know we can say I can I can say you know Israel has I I can look at it objectively and understand why they're doing things but you can't look objectively you're not allowed to you know it's made illegal to to look objectively even if you don't agree with the Palestinian resistance, Gustavo Petro, Venezuela, you're not allowed. You're literally not allowed. We saw it. We, people are beaten on college campuses because they're not allowed to even look objectively or even to have sort of transparency about their sort of investments, whether they're at a university or their sort of you know tax dollars, so to speak, or their sort of public institutions being used as weapons laboratories. So I just I wanted to point that out because it, it, it's there tends to be this sort of uh, knee jerk reaction uh, in in you know the you know the Western media. It's not just the United States. I think the United States is is um, more guilty of it. But what happens in this moment is like even everyday people are are not even allowed to think beyond you know the sort of the the ideological investments in the u.s state uh, and its quote-unquote interests in this region um, and so when we see even sort of a popular even a hedge like a, a counter hegemonic movement arise both in the united states and europe it has to be like the only response it reveals that masks you know you scratch a liberal and a fascist bleeds that's what happens you know that's what like, liberal democracy is essentially about when there's a challenge to that sort of class rule and that perception it's always going to be responded to with force uh, even against those who may have you know maybe invoking the same sort of democratic or moral you know visions that the the ruling class espouses um, but we're also not allowed to share uh, interest or uh you know, have a have an objective understanding of the reasons why, like Colombia, would break ties with with Israel, not understanding its history, not understanding you know uh, the position that it's been put in, not just by Israel but by the United States, is sort of this colonial outpost in Latin America that has, you know, genocided uh, indigenous people, then genocided campesinos, you know, and has served as an outpost for its interest in waging this dirty war against, you know, Venezuela and any sort of neighboring country that sort of falls out of line that delinks, as you as you put it earlier, like this isn't just a sort of economic, you know, uh, or cultural soft power that they're they're imposing. This is like a bloody, bloody history. And Israel is, you know, I think probably like, you know, it's it's when like when you think of like the apartheid South Africa movement, I think sometimes and nothing against the BDS movement, but sometimes I think, you know, in their idealism college, you know, maybe I was guilty of this too at a certain point in time, but there was a sort of idealism of, of nonviolent sort of protest, you know, and I, I'm not, I don't advocate for violence, but it's like, there's this idea that somehow nonviolent protests like defeated apartheid, which is a complete distortion because Israel was arming the the apartheid regimes they were backing Rhodesia the white supremacist uh, countries 
there was a lot of bloodshed. A lot of people died. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela was in prison because he refused to renounce armed resistance as a legitimate form of resistance. He was he was not. I mean, yeah, he was a peace activist, but he also believed in the right to self defense. And I think we've gotten to this point where it's like you've you've mentioned it earlier, and I you know we, we interviewed Francis Hasso um, before on this pod, podcast, and she talked about this sort of celebration of the iconography of you know the third world woman taking up arms you know fighting for national liberation but we can't actually have that sort of celebration or even understanding even if you don't agree with that we, we can't have that sort of same objective understanding in the present it's it's literally not allowed even if even if you like morally disagree with it or whatever you can't talk about it because it's illegal and if you talk about it <laughs> you're gonna be on a no fly list, you're going to, you know, you're going to be sanctioned, you're going to lose your job, right? So I think, I think what you're saying is is very important. But also, you know, you're talking about self defense as a as a legitimate sort of uh, uh, analytic and in, in understanding this particular situation. You know, self defense is like a human universe is like a species universal. <laughs> it's like a cross species universal, like most organisms engage in self defense when they're attacked. So are Palestinians aliens? Like, <laughs> what's the supposition here, right? Um, it, 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 it's a, it's a, it's actually the one of the most normal like trans species reactions you can possibly uh, find. Um, that you know to look to look for a, a that, that we would look for survival strategies in the face of of, of an attack. Um, you know, um, and and you brought up a lot of important points. So uh, you know, that a few things that one thing that came to mind is. You know, practically the last page of, um, I think it's Piero Glejaisi's uh, Conflicting Missions, is when he talks about, um, you know, the specter of, uh, of, uh, of, of black Cuban troops uh, beating, uh, uh, successfully defeating white mercenaries in uh, Angola. Um, and this how this was actually it was just a few weeks later, a few months later that the Soweto uh, uprising occurred, right? That this actually uh, broke uh, an important psychological barrier. Um, amongst the, 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 this was like the worry of, of all sorts of intelligence services. They were like, oh shit, like the, the, the these well-trained uh, black Cuban militia in one of like the major humanitarian interventions to use the phrase in like, in like modern history um, were, were actually catalytic in uh, the overall anti-apartheid struggle, right? And of course, this is all erased, the whole frontline states, the, the whole idea that there was a military front based on taking state power, right? This dirty word to take state power that was based on taking state power in the frontline states. This is all erased from, from um, this narrative, which I, I, to be very honest, like it is increasingly, you know, there's a narrative that's sold by NGOs and they're like funded by the, by the goddamn Rockefeller Foundation, right? Um, that sell this very sanitized version and of, um, of what's happening in Palestine, as though um, you know, as though just universal boycotts are going to uh, exert enough pressure on Israel. I mean, you know, I've participated in the nonviolent mobilizations against uh, Israel in Gaza. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I walked away with blood with blood on my hands, so um, of, of someone who was murdered in front of me. You know. Um, so I, I'm aware of what it looks like. And, you know, when, when this war started, one of the things I said, you know, because there was this kind of narrative about the fetishization of decolonial violence. These people like Adam, Adam Schatz and other people. And, I, you know, I puked a little in my mouth and I said, fetishization. I said, people, nonviolence and nonviolent and violence, when you're in a weaker position, are two ways to die, actually. There are two ways to resist and there are two ways to die, right? Um, so it, it, the idea that you that the outcome is nonviolent when you engage in nonviolent resistance is ludicrous. We saw our comrades getting their heads beaten in by police in New York City three days ago, right? There's video circulating of cops punching young people in the head in the middle of the street when they were engaging in a nonviolent protest, right? So all resistance to violent power 
elicits a violent reaction on the part of the powerful, because this is the language that they speak, right? So, so much of this is forgotten in the entire Western discourse about nonviolence that people are, uh, people are going to be destroyed physically and otherwise, no matter what form of resistance they take. I mean, there's a generation of amputees in the Gaza Strip that precedes the current generation. Of amputees, which of course uh, Hassan Abu Sitta and others will say they've never seen done more uh, pediatric amputations um, or seen them in a war zone in their entire life than before this. But even before this, during the Great March of Return, you know, which was entirely nonviolent, they were sh they were they were amputating people. I mean, these people don't have uh, the, these people don't have uh, a leg, right? Um, it, it's very shocking, right? So uh, you know, the, no one is. Um, no one is fetishizing anything, right? And this really is so important to keep in mind. Actually, the only people fetishizing anything are the people who are uh, advocating exclusively and saying anything but a peaceful nonviolence is outside our moral universe. Um, those are the ones who are actually fetishizing a certain form of, 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 of resistance. And they're fetishizing it and uh, obfuscating about what's actually at stake, which is mass death, right? Your, uh, your people are going to die en masse when you engage in a nonviolent resistance and like the great march of return, it may not produce a very large result, right? And now people are dying at a much greater pace. It's very sure, but the Israelis are responsible for that. And Americans are responsible for that. And the French are responsible for that. And the Germans are responsible for that. Not the people who are uh, uh, taking the, the measures, the measures they deem necessary in order that they can uh, try to have a future for themselves and their children. Right? So this is, this is super important. The other thing, that you said that um, you know when you were talking about um, about uh, Gustavo Petro, right? Is that the other thing that, that's so important, right? Is that you saw? Um, I actually haven't haven't seen. I'm sure you're right about what you were saying about these reactions to it. I thankfully was spared them. I didn't see them, um, but you know I saw it a lot about Ansar Allah in Yemen, right? Um, and it said uh, that they're just acting as cynical rulers of a country or engaged in cynical statecraft and they hate Jews. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, first of all, who put the Jewish star on a tank that fired an artillery shell at children? That was Israel that did that. That was not Palestinians who did that. That was not Arabs who did that. Israel decided to put a historical Jewish symbol on all of these forms of uh, machinery of death that just kills children, right? Um, and not only children, but also children. And so th the idea that people uh, are targeted in a certain way and then take up um, uh, mark, uh, take up the religious marker of the enemy that's been imposed upon them and might use certain rhetoric does not make them anti Semitic. Right. So I, I think, uh, you know, so this idea that Ansar Allah, um, you know, uh, even though that, yes, their their slogan is not great, I would be the first to admit it. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine to admit it. I don't agree with their slogan. Right. But uh, does Ansar Allah, did they do the Holocaust? Right. Did the Arabs do the Holocaust? Did Arabs uh, put five million Jews in a gas chamber? That was capitalist, white Christian capitalist Europe. Right. Ansar Allah is very clear. And first of all, there's also like socialist communists in the governing council of Ansar Allah. It's a very complicated uh, organization. And they say, oh, we want to impose a new law for humanity where genocide not occur, cannot occur. And suddenly they're cast as these cynical and also possibly bigoted uh, uh, rulers of, of Yemen. Right. And, uh, and people start who didn't know about Ansar Allah and didn't know about Yemen until six months ago are suddenly experts on the uh, 10,000 uh, perfidious misde alleged misdeeds of Ansar Allah, 1% uh, of which may be true. I don't care. But what if they are true? It's, not a, it's no question to me, right? You want to find you're looking for a, a state with 100% uh, clean hands. This is the real world. This is not a this is not Captain America movie, right? So the idea that, that Ansar Allah, which um, is, is stopping boats of Israel 
until the genocide stops, is uh, this nefarious, bigoted force is just an astounding feat of Western propaganda, right? It's it's crazy. I mean, and Israel was, of course, active in North Yemen um, during the conflict, right? It was uh, it was part of that effort to uh, burn up Nasserism um, in its struggle against the reactionary forces in North Yemen, which were armed by Saudi Arabia. And Israel, everyone in Yemen knows very well, uh, it, separating from uh, their own human solidaristic discourse with the suffering Palestinian people um, and the resisting Palestinian people, even bracketing that, right? Uh, everyone in Yemen, uh, or the overwhelming majority, would identify Saudi Arabia as, a, as their primary enemy, and they know that Israel would love nothing more than to normalize, to have a full normalization of diplomatic relationships with Saudi Arabia. It's very, uh, of course, they consider Israel their enemy. Israel is trying to break bread with the, uh, the, the steel hand of the U.S., that has been killing, that killed a half million of their people. Of course they see Israel as the enemy. I mean, how else could they see it, right? And what you're saying about this infantilization, demonization, um, uh, these uh, kind of right-wing mythologies around these forces that are actually just trying to make the world big enough for everybody is a, is a very kind of astounding thing. Um, and um, it shows, you know, and to the fact that it extends to a lot of the left liberal sphere, let's be honest, is just a feat of, uh, of of the success of Western propaganda, and really shows how much uh, a lot of you know uh, of the liberal left in the United States is still marching to the beat of the propaganda of U.S. power, right? Um, instead of saying, okay, there are these forces that are, uh, of course, imperfect because we're in the land of people and not God and heaven, you know, that are have all, have all their problems and that are doing something uh, that are that are. Uh, putting everything at stake um, as they just escape from a genocidal war against them to try to uh, assert, uh, achieve some dignity and save the lives of people they've never met. Well, you know, that's, um, th th that's something people would, would do well to better understand rather than um, reject and demonize. Yeah, there's there's a lot to say there, but it, you know, I think somebody as somebody coming from your perspective in terms of you know you you wrote a really good book on the Green New Deal, um, sort of really challenging. It's, I'm sorry, I'm shifting gears here a little bit, but uh, but I think there's you know there was um, uh, may, maybe these are like micro debates that don't even matter, but there was this sort of micro debate with like Andreas Malm and uh, I can't remember the other person in the Verso blogs. And I think Andreas Malm was kind of making this argument that like um, this moment in Palestine kind of represents a sort of rupture within the sort of climate movement and like really kind of calling out the sort of colonial uh, sort of first world approaches. And and then there was a sort of reaction. I don't know if you read this. And so maybe I'll, I'm just I'm summarizing because I don't want, you know, if you want to go read it, whatever, that's fine. But uh, a lot of it's a lot of it's not um, sort of worth reading because it's just it's just like regurgitated um, bad talking points. And the other, you know, this, there was a response to it basically said, you know, like the Palestinian resistance, Hamas, they are like anti-climate justice. They're anti all these things like to, to even say, suggest that, you know, this should be kind of incorporated in the climate justice movement is a complete misreading of the situation. But it's, it's fascinating to me because like having spoken to, you know, Francis Hasso about a lot of these things, there is, it's as if there's like no like Palestinian agency or whatsoever even talking about or like disagreeing or saying like, yeah, like we, you know, like, or, you know, that these discussions aren't happening whatsoever or that there isn't a concern for the environment or there's not, there's no scaling up of the sort of political project that they're doing. When in fact, even if you were just like, if you, even if you had a brain cell, you could look and say like, wow, like this small, tiny territory, which is smaller than the state of New Jersey, has actually completely shifted the political conversation and has changed not just the outcome of political possibility for the region, but also political possibility for the rest of the planet. So why is that? You know, you would think that that would be like the entry point into the conversation, but instead it's to sort of like trot out, um, no pun intended, trot out <laughs> um, tired tropes about, you know, backwards sort of uh, political projects, the same way that like people will condemn, like, you know, the the Bolivarian project for its reliance on fossil fuels, 
uh, to sort of to to create uh, sort of resource nationalism as if it's their fault, you know. And I think maybe you can speak about this because you you do talk about development a lot in this in both of these pieces and in your own you know your work outside of these these articles. But why is development you know central and and, and maybe related to this sort of climate just the broader sort of climate justice movement? You know, uh, just to, to enter it with, um, you know, Ismail Sabri Abdullah, who was uh, Egyptian a minister of planning um, and, and a communist, um, and one of the more important figures in third world ecology, has this beautiful repeated uh, refrain where he says one of the great errors of, um, of third world uh, development was to reduce uh, liberation to development and then development to industrialization, right? Um, what he meant was uh, not that anyone was anti-development and not that anyone was anti-industrialization, right? Not at all, right? He was very much in favor of both, as am I, um, but that those need to be in a framework of liberation, right? And I think liberation is so important in two senses, right? I mean, one, liberation in the Cabral sense of liberation of the development of your productive forces from the grip of monopoly capital, is which, which he equated with a socialist revolution, right? He said, okay, you need to change your property structures if you really want people with an interest in building up your nation's productive forces, which is a vocabulary that I use and think is valuable, right? If you want, if you want to rupture from capitalism, uh, rupture from from uh, from colonialism and neocolonialism, the second aspect, of course, Cabral emphasized less because he took it as a given, is that liberation means you have control over your territory, right? And people forget this all the time, right? That control over your territory is not sufficient for building a better world, but it's necessary for building a better world. You can't build a better world if you don't have some type of political control over your lands, right? Um, and this is why what's going on in Palestine is so important. This is what I tried to lift up in my book is that, okay, of course I want uh, people with a certain ideology or with a certain kind of set of ideologies, the specific one, I'm flexible about it, but a kind of a progressive and emancipatory and egalitarian ideology um, having control over a certain set of lands that is a, a state. Um, but you need to get control of it from the imperialists. Otherwise, they will burn you alive, right? And they will genocide you and famine you and so forth, right? That's the history of, of colonialism and settler colonialism, right? So you have to break. You have to break from that. And then you're in a position of underdevelopment, right? And then you decide what to do with your productive forces, right? And of course, um, you should do what, in my opinion, you know, what, what uh, Paris Yaros and, and Sam Moyo and Pravin Jha, um, who are, um, uh, you know, Brazilian and, and Indian and uh, Zimbabwe and Sam Moyo um, uh, died o almost a decade ago in a car crash, but very important, the, one of the most important African intellectuals um, of, of our modern period, um, you know, they said what is necessary is a sovereign industrialization. That is to industrialize without surrendering to the urge to industrialization, right? So they thought this was so important. And the entire, um, the entire third world, as I, as I read it, I mean, not the entire, but the great bulk of the third world national liberation tradition was in favor of development. They said, okay, we don't want capitalist development or we don't want you know, this kind of specific type of capitalist development that's been imposed upon us. But this word development, Right, we like it, and it was in Spanish, like uh, desarrollo autocentrado, uh, uh, auto centered development, and it was um, or autocentrico, and uh, similar um, in, in in the Arab region where I just know it best. You know, they always use the word development. Said al al tanmiya al tanmiya self reliant development, the same thing. Right. This was like a watchword. You can find it in dozens and dozens of, 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 of books and articles. They were all talking this way. And this is what Samir Amin meant also, autocentric development or uh, development autocentré, um, you know, when it when in, in like West Africa and Francophone West Africa and so forth. They were in favor of development because they understood the level of productive forces was not enough for a good life for their people 
And so you wanted to increase it. You wanted a comp sophisticated, which doesn't mean Western style, but it means sophisticated medical systems, right? Uh, like Cuba has a very complicated uh, medical system that uses extremely high levels of, of technology um, and uh, is the benefit of uh, a huge endowment of human knowledge and experimentation with huge investments in, in biotech, and like developing can lung cancers, right? It's amazing, right? This is development. This is high technology development, but it's development at the service of um, of a sovereign project with all of its contradictions, right? And, and this was attempted in Venezuela. What was the major uh, breaking points in the Venezuelan project, I think, was when the agrarian reform stalled, actually. Uh, I don't think it's a, an end point at all, right? I'm a supporter of, of the Proceso in Venezuela, but the, the, you know, the stalling of the agrarian reform was one of the major ruling class kind of uh, Venezuelan, but also American machinations against the, 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 the Chavismo in Venezuela, right? They really wanted to put a break on that when it was proposed um, and murdered, you know, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, revolutionary campesino organizers who are trying to kind of um, add heft to that, right? And so it, it just reminds us of the centrality of, of land and all of these issues, right? Um, and, you know, to circle back, and then, uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll take a breather, to circle back, you know, the Palestinian struggle is about land, right? I mean, uh, you, know, I, um, you know, I don't know what the discussion is like in, in your spaces and communities about it, but uh, I often think, I'm like, People kind of, for, it seems to me that it's, uh, even though it's very prominent in the Palestinian iconography, liberation and return, right? And there's a huge pastoral imagery in Palestinian posters, and it's about liberation of the land and return to the land, right? Uh, and Land Day is one of the, you know, uh, is one of the, March 30th is, you know, one of the central days of uh, kind of the Palestinian resistance calendar, right? When, when Palestinians in uh, historical Palestine, it's like 48 Palestine, were murdered by the Israeli regime. Um, it, you know, uh, it, land is so important, right? Land is, is so central to the Palestinian struggle. Land is like, you know, Israel racially allots land and doesn't allow even the Palestinians living in uh, historical Palestine to e even have access to land. Um, Israel is, uh, you know, I don't think it wants Gaza as land. That's a, that's a little bit different. I mean, it's too small. It's like it, more is at stake in the sense of the land. What's it, what's at stake is kind of the sovereign land base of, 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 of the Palestinian uh, anti-Semitic project. I mean, in, in the West Bank, there is massive land encroachment. The settler project is about land, right? Who owns the land? Is it going to be uh, owned by a sovereign settler colonial entity that then uses it and manages its internal capitalist class structure by saying, okay, you guys can have a little bit of land. We're going to keep the best land over here in Tel Aviv for uh, our wealthy white class um, and so forth. I mean, uh, you need land for that matter to build up a capitalist infrastructure as Israel has in spades, right? Land is so important. And yet it, it's it's reduced. I, I think too often the Palestinian struggle is, is viewed through international humanitarian law um, and uh, questions of rights, whereas this question of land um, becomes kind of sidelined, but I think it's just critical. Like uh, a political politics is, you know, who owns land, right? A lot of it, not 100%, but a huge part of, of our world politics is about who owns land. Even this is the only place the social Democrat whiners will acknowledge it. If you tell them, no, we're talking about real estate. They're like, oh yes, we have real estate in uh, in New York and Philadelphia. Okay, it's true. Real estate is very important for us to struggle over, but land, now that's some backwards bucolic shit. Don't talk about land. And we're like, well, how you build real? How are you gonna build real estate unless you have the land in the first place, right? I'm like, what planet are you guys on? I mean, so anyway, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit because they're just kind of silly and they got me rambling. But land is so important and it's, it's neglected in, in too much of the conversation. Well, three things. Uh, the first is to maybe kind of uh, do a rough translation of like what you were talking about in terms of the Arabic term for like auto development, or I would say maybe it's self-determined development would be a, a proper translation. My kind of limited Spanish and uh, French uh, auto tends to be self and I, the way that it's paired is it'd be like a self-determined development, meaning that it's like it's coming internally. And I think I think, uh, you know, like this is what I always say to people. It's like you want to talk about tribal politics and our, our tribal councils. And it's like, yeah, there's corruption. You know, there's 
there's all these misdealings, you know, there's uh, inefficiencies. I was like, but give us the land back and let us run our own affairs. And then, then you can, criti- then you can come criticize us. And, but until you're willing to do that, you can't really say anything because you're keeping in, you're keeping in place the same colonial structures that doesn't allow us to develop a, a, according to our own path. Like as Cabral said, you know, he was talking about returning to the source, not this kind of return to kind of an idyllic, you know, relationship with the land or this kind of romantic past is to say that all cultures, all societies, all peoples have a path of development. Colonialism, imperialism knocked those people off that path. And this sort of process of liberation is to return to that path according to your own values, customs, and your the needs of that society. And the only way to do that, you know, like is to, you know, the second point, you can't eat ideology. Like period. You can sit and, you know, like talk about, we need democracy, we need equal rights. But at the end of the day, are you feeding people? Like, I think this question of land and, you know, what you're talking about agrarian reform is incredibly important. If you look at a place like Venezuela, it is so fertile. It is so fertile. You know, it it could produce its own food if it wanted to. Um, but as we've seen over, you know, there's like a, you know, there's a monopoly, a monopolization, monopoly capital has sort of cornered the market on, you know, wheat production and imports and things like that. And sort of, you know, you can, we can sit and like, Hey, we want a socialist project, but at the end of the day, like those companies are controlling the levers of the calories that are going into people's bellies. Right. And it's, it's a huge leap for society to take. I mean, look at what happened with China, like hundreds of millions of people, you know, were were lifted out of poverty uh, because they had agrarian reform, you know, and it wasn't, I'm not saying like there was, there was problems with it. Like, I'm not the one, you know, going to wave the banner and say like, this is the perfect thing, but they tried and they experimented and it was for, you know, for all, uh, all intents and purposes, it was a pretty good success. I mean, what other country, what other nation, what other period in history can we say that, you know, a society goes from a backward sort of feudalistic society where people were literally starving to death to one in which the, you know, there's no extreme poverty. Like that's, you know, even if in a a normative developmental sort of UN standard, like that became the model, right? The Chinese model of like, of agrarian reform and and sort of agrarian development. Um, The third point uh, that you brought up, and I think you know, or you, you kind of touched on it. And I think a lot about it in terms of like the NGOization of struggle. And it seems a li- like there's, there is that in the United States, which is its own kind of issue, right? But I think in the context of, of Palestine, and when it comes to the, the question of land, I think you're absolutely correct in many ways, like the struggle is framed through the sort of international legal framework, um, without really sort of understanding that it's like, people got to eat, you know, and the UN and these NGOs have also created um, a form of dependency um, that is that is also an attempt, you know, it is also in itself a form of counterinsurgency. And we can see that. I'm not saying that these UN agencies are, you know, intentionally doing this, but it's part of this kind of broader process. It's like, what are the first things that they target? They target aid trucks. They target water because they've created a system of dependency. And so if you're not having that lar- that lar- that larger question about land and it, it, I agree with you it's even in the US it's like people take land for granted as if it's just some kind of uh, abundant surplus or if like returning to the land is some sort of like return to the past you know I think we look at like um I, and this is maybe this is sort of my warped western mind because I was raised on western culture you know it's like if we look at like zombie apocalypse movies like I think the series, The Walking Dead is incredibly important and informative because it's like, okay, so you've eliminated the structure of capitalism, you've eliminated the government, right? And it's the apocalypse. And what do you guys do? Like, oh, it's like the women like don dresses and they start like, you know, doing the doing the the laundry like they did in the good and the the good old days. There's not like, it's, it's just so fascinating. It's like, so in the absence of, you know, these oppressive structures, you just, you're, the idea is to like, move back to sort of an idyllic past when women had a role like that was subordinated to men you know i mean that's one sort of small example but i think in the sort of context of like looking at or imagining like a political alternative you when you think of something like you know land back it gets sort of caricaturized as something that is like 
you know, oh, like, what are we going to do? Like, just allow like a bunch of wild Indians, like savage Indians running around, like hunting, you know, and it's like, well, who makes your food? Like, where do you get your food? When you go to the grocery store, do you know where your food comes comes from? Do you know the people whose hands pick that food? Do you know their families? You know, are they getting fair wages? Are they living a good life? You know, who's controlling the distribution of that food? And if you can't answer that question, then you need to shut up about the question of land because you don't you don't know, you know, and it's it's created also a system of consumerism and dependency where it's like the point, of, you know, it's like goods that could be grown here, items that could be grown on the land, this bountiful land that we have in America are actually grown somewhere else on the same a similar plot of land. But the only difference is they can exploit those people who grow that, you know, grow that food at a higher rate than they can exploit you. And so that's the logic of capitalism. Add in, factor in the sort of transportation, the fossil fuel consumption, the immense amount of energy, you know, to condense time and space to get these commodities so that you can, you know, realize the value in a grocery store somewhere else. Like that, that is a question of land and who controls the land fundamentally. It's, it's not this idea that somehow like native people are going to go and do, you know, uh, to you what, you know, your ancestors did to them. You know, like if you think that that's a cynical view and it means that you've invested ideologically in this walking dead narrative of like, there can only be, the only alternative is utter collapse and just a, you know, like fascism essentially. And Gustavo Petro of all people, God bless him, you know, said this, he said, Hitler is knocking at the door of the middle classes of Europe. And I would include the United States in that because your alternative to this climate catastrophe is not to extend, you know, human, hum, humanitarian sort of aid in a, not, not in the kind of like colonial imperialist sense. Um, but it's to close your borders. It's to harden your borders. It's to increase, you know, the militarization, not only of your borders, but other countries' borders to prevent the movement of people. No better case exists than in Palestine. <laughs> where you have the majority of people who are on the brink of famine or experiencing famine, right? And I also think that this gets to the other, another question that it's like, we can sit and be so disturbed by the brutal and horrific scenes of like military exterminationist campaigns. But I think what's also uh, more horrific in my mind is not understanding the brutality of controlling food supplies and water and medical supplies in, in you know, in, in Palestine, but also in, in countries that are sanctioned by the United States. Um, you know, you talked earlier about Iran sort of buying Chinese parts and things like that. And, you know, China is like also now the, what is soon to be the leader of, you know, electric vehicles. Um, but, when we think about, well, I have, I have two points that I want to make. One is that when we think about this situation, we think about, you know, Venezuela. I have really good friends in Venezuela. I remember the time when the sanctions were really bad. Everyone's, everyone got thinner because they were just not eating as much food. There was just not as much food like available. Uh, now it's, things have changed a little bit, but like, you know, they estimated during the Trump, the Trump years that like 40,000 people died of sanctions. That's more than people who died of the, the, the direct military violence in Palestine. We're not even talking about the indirect sort of consequences of the genocide, which, well, I would say maybe are direct consequences um, um, of like starvation, lack of you know access to medical supplies. This sort of, uh, I guess, quantity of suffer suffering or quality of suffering never gets accounted for because it, it can't be splashed to pay, you know across the page of the New York Times. It can't be, you know, there's not, it's not as quote unquote sexy for the Western mind to see somebody starving. It's something that's actually much easier to, to sort of forget or to sort of, you know, shut her off into the, the dark corners of the world. Um, and I guess like in the, the sort of final analysis in this conversation, um, cause I mentioned China and I mentioned where, you know, you, you talk about the sort of the geopolitics of the region, which I think is incredibly important. And, you know, the United States destroyed Iraq. It, you know, it, it intervened within uh, the, the Syrian war. It created 
a sort of destructive, you know, force and, and, uh, you know, in that, in that conflict. Um, but I think what's fascinating is we see Iraq, you know, has a national movement that is uh, allied itself with this, you know, this so-called axis of resistance. But while the United States destroyed Iraq, who's rebuilding Iraq? Where are those investments coming from? They're coming from China. And I, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, um, if, you know, China's like, like what you said earlier, the United States is trying to, it doesn't care if it's Chinese communism or whatever, it just wants it to be subservient to the US economy. And in this moment in time, it's like, if you look at even how Latin America, even if there are sort of moderate or even right wing governments, it's almost completely shifted. The major trade partner is now China. This is the reality, like whether you like it or not, this is the objective reality. They're not talking about it in, you know, some the financial times might talk about it a little bit, but in this moment in time, we see sort of two political projects that are one political project and an economic project that is happening in the region. One, one political project is this sort of resistance to sort of U.S. hegemony uh, and uh, its outpost in Israel in that region. Uh, allied with you know various forces, whether it's Palestinian resistance, Iran, Syria, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the forces in Iraq. But also, you see the sort of alternative, the the sort of the thing that's going to pick up the pieces, so to speak, and provide uh, you know just investments uh, to a large degree when compared to the WTO and the US um, will be China. And and what like, what are your what are your thoughts on that that particular assessment and like how you know, even nations like Venezuela or Iran have kind of bucked sanctions by sort of creating these strategic economic partnerships with a country like China. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, those components are very important. And I mean, it's very clear that, you know, if, if, um, if you know, I, I believe that um, Israel will, will be defeated in its ambitions. Um, and if, if or when that happens, uh, of course, the only source of, of capital that won't be totally uh, politically constrained and used basically um, uh, as a kind of uh, carrot where um, uh, and, and its withdrawal of possible punishment is Chinese capital, right? There's no other, um, th there won't be any other capital forthcoming. It's not like the U.S. is going to allow in reconstruction aid if Hamas is still in a strong political position in the Gaza Strip, the U.S. will not put capital. It would probably be like, in fact, like running against the grain of its own uh, so-called counter-terror legislation, right? Um, it, it, you know, if Hamas is the regnant uh, political power in, in the Gaza Strip, there's no, there'll be uh, no U.S. reconstruction aid. And so will the Chinese be allowed in? Well, that would re that's going to rely, rest on the political um compact that secures um an end to to the current stage of of the war i mean the which won't last forever although it, it of course seems like that it seems like it is but um it, you know one of the other um again one of the other major roles that china is playing right is its trade with iran right that oil sales have been uh redirected that uh, the Iranian uh, defense industrial base, which has been upgraded under um, Raisi, right, um, is kind of interlinked, of course, has autonomous capacity because Iran post-revolution has massively invested in scientific research and development. Um, although its, it's, its engineers are routinely, of course, assassinated by Israel. But um, its, its defense industrial base is also very much connected with the Russian and the Chinese defense industrial bases, which um, have kind of longevity and therefore capacity that doesn't exist in, in Iran, which is still very much uh, a poor country, right? Um, and has also been sanctioned aggressively in, although in ways that have prevented uh, a greater buildup. Of its of its industrial capacity, and also that its industrial capacity until the revolution was organically interlinked with the West, right? So suddenly, all of those, uh, a lot of those parts, and even including the legacy infrastructure, the planes, and so forth, 
Um, the helicopters, a lot of that was secured from the West, which kind of makes uh, the, the maintenance very difficult, um, let alone the, the upgrading. So it, because of the existence of Russia and China as non as relatively, only relatively autonomous poles of uh, accumulation of the productive forces, that is high technology, machine tools, everything, right? Because of that capacity, Iran is able to look north and look east, right? And say, okay, uh, we can secure certain forms of uh, computer technology. We can secure certain forms of high tech that we cannot make domestically because we're a small, semi-industrialized country, um, but that we need and that allow us to uh, build up our capacity for self-defense. So this is very vital. And like, you know, um, uh, I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it, it's, uh, you know, it's not quite clear to me what is the agenda of the current political leadership of China. I mean, I think there's, of course, a, a, a capitalist class that is able to accumulate um, an excess of wealth in, in China. Um, there's also, there's been a massive development of the productive forces over the last 30 or 40 years. You have massive also, because of the autonomous struggles of the workers, really, you have massive increases in the minimum wage and the strengthening of, of the internal market. You have a lot going on in China. Right. It's not very, it, one, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, it can be reductive, I think, to slap a label on it. But what's essential is that countries are not uh, playing a fantasy game. Right. Countries need capital. Countries need markets. Countries need supply routes. Countries need technology. Where are you going to get that? You're going to get it from China. So it's I think a net it's clearly a net good for the third world um, that China uh, is able currently to offer this set of, of resources. Um, yes, it's probably made certain, um, you know, it, is China engaging in socialist style trade with uh, the third world? No, definitely not, right? It's, I think we can be, we should be honest about things like that, right? Because one, we just shouldn't, it's silly to lie. Um, and two, you know, it would be great if China could be pressured into a uh, trade that was like at parity, that is, uh, was equal based on labor hours that went into uh, the traded goods. It's not doing that right now with Latin America. It's not doing that right, that right now with Africa. It's not doing that right now with Southeast Asia. I would love if China were able to do that. I would support countries in uh, the remainder, the, the third world, uh, engaging in uh, negotiations with China to force it to uh, adapt right? If it's possible. And if they need to band together to do it also, I agree. Um, but nevertheless, like China is able to put resources third world the, the, at the disposal of third world development, that then uh, it's the responsibility of people in the third world to decide what are the contours of their internal developmental strategy. But China is not going to cease to put the resources at those countries disposable disposal if they go hard left like i don't see that happening either like this is china has a policy of non-interference i mean no china also doesn't have a great policy at all with respect to israel right they like buy weapons from israel and they like have a lot of technological trade and so forth like these things shouldn't be papered over either right you could say china's playing the long game i'm like well maybe but China has to be uh, at this point with this level of contradiction in the world system. Is it strictly necessary for China to be engaging in like weapons trade with Israel? Come on now, I don't think so. But um, these are, this is the world we live in, uh, and nevertheless, like China is also doing a lot in terms of its its um, its kind of the backstop or its uh, the concrete uh, technological and trade-based infrastructure that allows Iran to thrive. And Iran is the major supporter of um, asymmetric guerrilla resistance forces, uh, armed forces that are um, uh, preventing the consolidation of Israeli colonialism. So lights and shadows. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, you talk about this in the article, and maybe this is a good place to end it, but, you, you know, you're very clear that the Israeli settler project is the most unstable and least consolidated settler colonial project in the world right now. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think there's two sides of the coin. One is like, that could be incredibly dangerous. Um, I mean, we're seeing that danger kind of unfold right now and the horrors of that, you know, this eliminationist project, but also um, I think there's a lot of kind of like possibility again, um, in terms of not just 
decolonization uh, for you know Palestine, but also this bigger question of decolonization. I, I think it's fascinating here. You know, locally we have students who are very interested in like not just like saying land back, you know, as an abstract sort of concept, but understanding that the university itself is not only invested in the military industrial project, uh, uh, project, uh, you know, writ large, but then specifically uh, has these investments within Israeli settler colonialism that are, you know, destroying Palestinian life, but also saying that like its investments began as a militarized project as a land grant university to destroy indigenous communities. You know, there's not like, you don't need to be uh, a, an academic to see how the, how those things are connected. The land grant was a militarized project, like the militarization, military industrial uh, uh, complex didn't happen because Eisenhower said it, you know, uh, in a post-World War II moment, it was literally written into law with uh, public universities. Like part of the land grant, you know, university system was to train people, train uh, white settler males in martial, you know, martial combat like that was you know to basically train an armed settler force um so maybe like you can talk a little bit about that sort of like possibility also you know <laughs> potential for catastrophe i mean as we're experiencing in the instability of that sort of settler project yeah i mean the the possibility is that if if the racial structure falls in, in Palestine, in historical Palestine, right? The military components of uh, Israeli capitalism will disappear, right? Because those, those rest organically, not only on the militarization of, um, of, of politics in, in historical Palestine, but also on settler control over that entire apparatus. Right. Because you aren't going to allow, you know, to allow that much military capacity to endure for uh, the West to invest in it. You have to trust that it's going to remain under your control, which is like a central asset of Israel. So if that falls, a major motor of world militarism is distinct from imperialism. Right. But a major motor of world militarism falls, too. Right. Um, there is no imperialism, of course, with without militarism. Right. There's no imperialism without you know, violent militaries and militias and everything, right? Controlling um, and violently uh, repressing um, and also the, the, the arms sales themselves and shortening people's lifespans and all of these things that arms themselves do as a, as a necessary component of imperialism, all that will fall um, if the racial project falls. Um, you know, the whole regional arms sales system I mean, it won't, I don't know that it will automatically collapse, but a, a huge port, you know, the, the, um, a huge pretext for massive military spending on a world, on a, on a regional scale is, and the massive diversion of domestic industrial resources to militarization, um, is the existence of Israel. So you're just going to, you free up a lot of developmental resources for popular development. Um, you also, you know, the, all the technology of repression used in states with this, that are so different from one another, from Lula to Modi, right? Totally different states, but both uh, have a lot of weapons uh, purchases, counterinsurgency technology purchases from Israel. You know, it's not like cap, like I, it's like what I was saying before. It's not like capitalism will just like it doesn't need concrete capitalists in concrete places to function. It needs all that stuff. And if there's not a grounds for military testing um, and weapons testing, then this is an asset for liberation for uh, progressive forces and egalitarian forces on a world scale. So Israel's role in worldwide repression will, uh, if it's evaporated, then worldwide repression as a systemic kind of logic in the world system is correspondingly weaker, right? Um, uh, you know, I would immediately see uh, struggles in the Arab Iranian region turning from the national plane that is toward a, a self-defense um, and defense of political sovereignty, much more towards internal redistribution um, without the threat of Israel. So I think this kind of move to peace would uh, have a liberating effect on a world scale, right? Not to mention, if people see that Israel, this kind of Sparta, this heavily armored Sparta with nuclear weapons, um, could be 
brought down, that its racial structure, the, the racist structures could be uh, uh, eliminated, right? I think a lot of people would have hope from that, right? Because uh, a lot of struggles that people elsewhere are facing, whether they're as severe or not as severe as Israel, you know, there's no there's no point necessarily to compare. It's like invidious, but like, you know, they, they would see, okay, these people under these very disadvantaged situation uh, managed to eliminate this kind of horrible racial structure that was bearing down on them. Uh, we could do it too. You know, hope is contagious. Hope is super contagious, which is also why counter revolution is so also invested on the ideological sale scale at uh, at sowing hopelessness. Right? It's a it's a major export product of uh, imperialism and also imperialist reformism is uh, the export and distribution of hopelessness. And so uh, anything that that can give hope to uh, people who are in the uh, short end of the stick of the current world order. Um, would be, is great. And so I think it would, you know, people were mocking it. They're like, oh, you think the overthrow of Israel is going to end imperialism and capitalism? No, it's going to take a lot of things to overthrow imperialism and capitalism. But uh, imperialism and capitalism is a bunch of little pieces. And if you dismantle one of the pieces that's a very important, then you made it weaker. Like, what else do you want? <laughs> you know, this is the real world. Yeah, thanks for that. And I also think it's it's quite heroic, you know, to think about how, um, you know, literally people in sandals are the ones who are the front line of this. It's not some sort of like modern, you know, like what we, I, I, I shouldn't, it is a modern war, but it's like, it's not like this sort of, it's asymmetric as you pointed out earlier. And um, there is, you know, it's it's a very compelling sort of, um, it's a, it's a very compelling case and it, it always has been you know, like all anti-colonial movements have been. Um, it's just in the moment. And I, you know, I think about this too, like the strategy is it's something that we we can't understand, um, you know, unless we're sitting in the room with people who are making this strategy. Um, but we also know that, you know, like it's a, it's a process. It's not an event necessarily. It's a series of events. Um, it's a series of catastrophes, man-made catastrophes. Um, but it's also, you know, it's like it, it's a long time coming and yeah. And I, I do agree with you. It's like, it's like, there's this kind of tendency to be like, Oh, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. And it's like, well, no, this is, this is important. Cause if it wasn't important, then why are they responding this way? If it was so easy to do this and why, why don't, why don't they just quote unquote finish the job? And I'm not, I'm not saying that in the, in a, in a uh, sort of um, flippant, flippant way. It's because there is both external and internal sort of forces at play that are holding this really, I, you know, it's, it's this, this very delicate sort of balance of power, um, you know, and, and I really appreciate your comments. I always, you know, Max, I always appreciate your commentary on Facebook or not Facebook, uh, Twitter or whatever it is today, X, your, your account is locked, but, um, I, I really appreciate your, you know, your perspective on a lot of things. And, you know, I really enjoyed reading, um, these articles we'll post them in the show notes, but, uh, is there any way that people can follow your work? Um, uh, you know, I know your Twitter account is locked, but um, is there is there any other way that they can like find you online? Uh, all my stuff is open access on my research gate. Um, you know, my web page, it's uh, I broke it a couple six years ago and uh, I haven't managed to fix it yet. <laughs> so I will plan on doing that at some point, but like you can find anything I wrote, um, open access PDFs on, on my research gate. So maybe that's best to send people there. Perfect. Well, thanks again for joining us. And, um, yeah, well, ho hopefully we can have you on soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. It was a great conversation and, um, I appreciate it.